Proverbs 13, 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And then Proverbs 23, 13 through 14 says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with the rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. If I had to do it over again, I would include this, Proverbs 22, 6, um, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, oh, bless us and encourage us as we think of this heavy duty uh, that you've given us. You have given us children as a blessing, as a reward, and it is our responsibility and privilege to raise them up to know you, God, and to declare your goodness to the generations that will follow them. Strengthen us in this work uh, for your glory and their good. In your son's name, amen. So last week, we considered Psalm 127, and it has this uh, wonderful set of verses. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is a man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. It's a wonderful passage because it runs contrary to our culture, and our culture has come to despise children. Right? It has a low view on children. People um, talk a lot about children, they think, but they talk about fur babies. Okay. Now, if it has whiskers, as a rule, that's not a kid. Okay. That's not. If whiskers means it's not a, a child. But uh, I guess I got to be careful nowadays with all the things going on in our society, right? But children are a blessing. They are a gift. They're a wonderful thing to receive from God's hand. But the thing that we wanted to drive home, that I wanted to drive home last week, is that this passage is not talking about little kids. We know that because it talks about their ability to defend their father in the gates. So the gates would either be a place where you meet and negotiate with the enemy prior to war, or it could be where you'd uh, meet and have some sort of uh, case, like a court case or a judgment. And a lot of times, uh, the well-being of your children can be caused as an example of you being a faithless man. And this says, when you raise them up, the fear of the Lord, no matter what that means, they represent their blessing. And so this is a call to raise children up to fear God. And that's a heavy duty. And that's why that psalm starts with, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain who builds it. That's um, to remind us to trust in the goodness of God as we approach uh, the, the hard work of parenting. Now, how do you raise them up to fear the Lord? That's what we're going to be talking about the, uh, the next three weeks. And today, we're going to talk about the rod of discipline. Now, Solomon, he says, whoever spares the rod hates his son there is a good bit of consternation around the topic of spanking. It's increasingly common to hear people speak of spanking as if it is uh, identical with physical abuse, as if it is the same thing as beating a child. Matter of fact, 58 countries have outlawed all forms of corporal punishment, corporal meaning physical, and they claim spanking is a violation of the child's human rights. Uh, There's funny enough, uh, it's against the law in New Zealand, and they forced a, a issue, what do they call it, a reformate, or what do you call it? Anyway, they all voted on it, and they said, we think this law should be overturned. And 85% of New Zealanders say, no, we think we should be allowed to spank our kids because we're doing it anyway. And the government refused to overturn the law. And so there, it's, it's common more and more to hear people treat spanking as if it's the exact same thing as hitting and this anti-spanking idea seeped into the church in many ways. Sometimes I've heard it uh, referred to as peaceful parenting or gentle parenting, and that's, that's great marketing. I, I respect that. Um, now, how do they make this uh, claim in light of the verses we see in Proverbs? It seems pretty clear to me. Well, they claim that the rod of discipline is merely metaphorical. And I do actually agree that there is a metaphorical sense to the rod. I don't see any other way if you study scripture. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is dealing with a wayward church, with Corinth. It's got all sorts of problems. It's divisive. They have all these different parties within the church. Um, It's not using spiritual gifts right. There's all sorts of sexual sin. There's all sorts of issues. 
It's a very proud church. And Paul, as an apostle, is calling them to repentance, to get things back in order. And he wants them to practice church discipline, and he's intending to, to visit them to make sure that they do it. And in verse 21 of chapter 4, he writes, What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Now, Paul wasn't literally going to spank the Corinthians. We don't, he didn't do that there, and that is not something we do here either, okay? Um, that's not this type of church. God forbid they exist. Um, it is metaphorical. He's using the rod to re, uh, represent corrective church discipline. In other words, the rod can metaphorically refer to various forms of corrective discipline. It's not limited to just spanking. In a church context, it's always metaphorical. It can refer to a stern warning. The first step of church discipline is always the admonition. Stop it. Don't do that, right? It can uh, refer to removing an officer, say a pastor from office, or suspending him from office for a time if he is engaged in some immoral or false doctrine and won't repent especially. It can actually refer to even excommunication of a member. All those things fall within that metaphorical use of the word rod. In the context of a home, it can refer to a stern rebuke, a loss of privileges, and so forth. And though it's not limited to spanking, it definitely includes it. Proverbs 23, 13 says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. That is clearly speaking of physical spanking. It's not talking about uh, striking them with a harsh word. No one back then thought words would kill somebody. The whole words are violence things, the modern creation of a sissified society. When we were kids, we would sing, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Now, what that means, it doesn't mean words don't hurt you emotionally. <laughs> words definitely can. And kids, they're great at it. Anything that, if you're, if you're like, don't feel good about your nose, or maybe you have a weird looking toe, or whatever, kids just like, that's what you're going to be, the weird toe, toe kid the rest of your life. Kids are going to pick up. The kids know how to do that. I'm not saying those things don't hurt. It's talking about it doesn't actually break your bones. It doesn't physically hurt you. You know, they can't kill you. And this verse is exhorting parents to spank. Good parents don't want to hurt or injure their children. And they're little, and they're tiny, and you're big. Even if you're a small woman, you're still way bigger than, than when they're little. And so no one wants to hurt them, and that can make you um, hesitant to actually um, spank them. And that can lead you to withhold proper correction. So Solomon says, don't. It, it, it won't kill them. They're not going to die. Spanking as one part of discipline, is helpful. It's even needful. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Now, folly or foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. This isn't referring to the childish silliness of little kids. You know, you ever have kids try to tell you knock-knock jokes? And they just make no sense, right? You know, knock, knock, who's there? Orange, orange, orange fish, ha, 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 And they're like, running, like, what? And that doesn't mean anything. It's not, you know, you may want to spank them for that sort of stuff when they tell it 20 <laughs> times in a row <laughs> with little variations. It goes from fish to raccoon or whatever, like, all right, I'm going outside. Um, but here, folly refers to evil. That's what it refers to. Remember in Proverbs that fool is a moral category. A fool is a man who refuses to submit himself to God or the ways of God. And that's why a fool says in his heart, there is no God. He's a rebel from his heart. In his commentary on Proverbs, Charles Bridges writes, it's a long quote, but it's a good one. A child is to be punished, as Mr. Scott wisely observed, not for being a child, but for being a wicked child. Comparative ignorance, the imperfect and gradual opening of the faculties, constitute the nature, not the sinfulness of the child. The holy child increased in wisdom. But foolishness is the mighty propensity to sin, imbibing wrong principles, forming bad habits, entering into an ungodly course. It includes all the sins of which the child is capable, lying, 
deceitful, willfulness, that means kind of a, a self-willedness, uh, perversity, want of submission to authority, all seeds of future evil multiplying to a fruitful harvest. We delight in our children's harmless play. We would make ourselves one with them in their sportiveness. But this foolishness, visible every hour before our eyes, never let it be subject of sport, but of deep and constant sadness, nor let childhood plead as an excuse for it. So there's a difference between a kid just being silly and, and, and being goofy and all that, and a kid's willful disobedience, which you see from a very, very young age. Along the same lines, J.C. Ryle writes, and I'll be pulling from him a lot, especially the next two weeks. He has a great sermon called The Duties of Parents. You can look it up on Grace Gems. It's, it's really helpful. But along the similar lines, J.C. Ryle writes, remember, children are born with a decided bias towards evil. Therefore, if you let them choose for themselves, they are certain to choose wrong. The mother cannot tell what her tender infant may grow up to be, tall or short, weak or strong, wise or foolish. He may be any of these things or not. It is all uncertain. But one thing the mother can say with certainty, he will have a corrupt and sinful heart. It is natural to us to do wrong. Foolishness, says Solomon, is bound in the heart of a child. And a child left to himself brings his mother shame. Our hearts are like the earth of which we tread, let it alone, and it is sure to bear weeds. Let it alone, and it is sure to bear weeds. Now, this is the point of divergence between biblical parenting and most other forms of parenting. Ryle calls it the first principle of Christian training, namely the recognition that mankind, from conception, from the very, very beginning, possesses a sinful nature. We aren't merely a product of nurture. Nurture is part of it. Shaping influences definitely matter. Well, they, they better because God honors it. And that's one thing we trust him. But we have a nature problem. We have a sin nature problem. In Psalm 51.5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So he's talking about, it's Psalm 51 is his meditation on his sinfulness and his repentance before God. He's not talking about his mom doing something wrong there. It's, the, it's in the context of something wrong with him. He's talking about, I've been sinful since the womb. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, it calls us sons of disobedience. And then it zeroes in even more on what that means. In verse 3, Paul says, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It's not just a portion of mankind, but all of mankind are children of wrath by nature. Genesis 8, verse 21 says, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. What does youth mean? Is this an age of accountability? You're not going to find an age of accountability in Scripture. It's nowhere in there. You can try really hard. You may say, well, youth means like 12 or 13 or 14. No, no, it doesn't. Jonathan Edwards, in his classic work, The Great Christian Doctrine of Original Sin, defended, remarks, uh, he says this on this verse, the word translated youth signifies the whole or the former part of the age of man, which commences from the beginning of life. The word in its uh, der uh, derivation has reference to the birth or beginning of existence, so that the word here translated youth comprehends not only what we in English most commonly call the time of youth, but also childhood and infancy. So it's talking about all the way back. That's what the Hebrew word means. So we are born with rebellious hearts darkened by sin. That's not what the world believes. The world believes that we're basically good, and then society corrupts us. But what Scripture teaches is that we have a sin nature, and that's why society is corrupt. You have to think about it. Where did the corruption, if, if corruption only comes from nurture, just track it back. Where, where did the corruption start? Right? If it's only brought into us by society, who brought it into society? We did. Right? It's, it's one of those things that if you just follow it back far enough, it doesn't end up making sense. And sin produces destruction in this life and results, potentially, if you're not born again, in eternal death. Now, Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So 
death is, uh, was the penalty of sin. Uh, God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree, that dying they shall die, right? You will die. So it's speaking of the start of a, de- a process of death that results in a finality of death that will go on for everywhere. But that's where disease and pain and all the terrible sins of the world, uh, they bring with them consequences. That's why I always like to remind people that sin's not just wrong, it's bad, right? It brings bad things into the world, destructive things into the world. It brings pain. So when we spank, we're not uh, just spanking to modify behavior. It goes much further than that. We actually spank to save souls, that is what it says in Proverbs 23, 14. It says, if you strike him with the rod, you'll save his soul from Sheol. Now, Sheol means the place of death. And sometimes it's just talking about death, the place of death in kind of a generic way. And sometimes it carries with it a much more heavy sense of judgment. And you just have to look how it's used in the passage. Is this saying if you spank their kids, they'll never die? No, it's talking about if you spank your kids, they won't fall into a sinful way of death the destruction that leads to uh, from a life that's rebellious and given over uh, to self-will. And so spanking is a means. So a means is something God works through to call children to faith and repentance. We don't spank them, that's how they get saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God uses that. That's why uh, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Withholding spanking is not peaceful parenting. It is not gentle parenting. It is hateful parenting. That is what it is. It is giving a child over to his own ways. We don't let our kids decide what religion they're going to fall. Fosters are Christians. You go to church, you participate in worship. God is awesome. We are so thankful to be saved And I'm going to teach them this is a true way. There's not like all equal ways. There is one way and everything else is false. And we tell that to our children. Now we call them the faith. Believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus. Lean on him. He's my only hope. He's your only hope too. Our hope isn't being born genetically into a Christian family. It isn't merely going to church. It isn't merely in the means. It is in the gospel. It is trusting the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But often we play these things like they're against each other. And they're really just hand in glove. They work t- together. So withholding and spanking is not love. And listen to Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So look, the assumption is if you're a dad, you discipline your son. If you are left without discipline in which we all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we all have had earthly fathers who discipline us, and we respected them. That is one thing you find out really quick, both as a father or anyone with authority. When you correct someone in love, they almost always are way more dedicated to you down the line. They start to trust you. In a church, a lot of people have never been told, stop it. What you're doing is wrong. You may not do that. Stop it. It's against God's word. And you think you'll tell those people, when you tell those people that, they'll never, they'll leave and never come back. They sometimes leave for a couple Sundays. Let me tell you right now, they often do come back because people think that was right. I'm so glad that someone warned me. And sometimes it takes much longer. But when people, when someone disciplines, think of your coaches, right? Like if you played any sport, um, there's times where you just couldn't stand your coach, the way they screamed at you, spit dropping off their lips and stuff, right? But then you look how far you went because how hard they push you. And you recognize that it wasn't just for them. They saw something in you that you didn't see, and they thought they could get it out if they pushed you. So you end up respecting them. That's a good, how you people react to a good authority, You recognize they're doing it out of love, and it's not selfish. You'll respect your fathers when they discipline you. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. And that is a fact. We get our kids for a short time. I saw this chart that gave you the number of days you have with your kids at different ages. 
And I'm realizing that there's some of my kids, I have less than a thousand days with them probably in my house, right? It's crazy. At once it was like, you know, thousands and thousands of days. But now it may even be in the hundreds if they get really ambitious. Um, but it, it goes quick. It's a short time. And we discipline them as seems best to us. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the, mo- <clears throat> for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now take that last verse in because it's key to understanding discipline. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The choice to discipline or not discipline is the choice of where and when you or those under your care will experience pain and discomfort. You're going to feel pain somewhere. You're going to feel it. You can't avoid it. It's coming to you. It will visit all of us in different ways. It's unavoidable. If you refuse to discipline yourself and miss out fun to get a paper done on time, you will experience the pain of a bad grade and perhaps the need to repeat an entire class. If you refuse to moderate your appetite and exercise your body somehow, you will experience the pain of failing health, especially in later life. The pain of jogging, right, and being embarrassed, jogging along the road. You don't want people to look at you. Or the pain of, like, not being able to tie your own shoes when you're 50, right, 60. If you refuse to discipline the members of your church and pander to their sins, then you'll experience the pain of a congregation that indulges in sin and disrespects the, the, the authority of the elders and will likely not last. It will split. If you refuse to discipline children in their youth, you will likely experience the pain of a wayward and evilly potentially apostate child in your old age. And that, as far as I can tell, is one of the greatest pains to experience in this life. I should say, is this a side note? I know some of you were faithful and the child walked away. I'll come back to that in a second. I don't want you to lose heart. You're going to experience pain, and the main choice you get is where you experience it. As Proverbs 29, 15 says, the rod and reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. To, de- to deny your children the love of corrective discipline is to experience shame in late life. So what will you choose? Temporary pain early in life or the lasting heart-wrenching pain in late life, perhaps even before the judgment throne? Some of you children, are you listening to your parents? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Do you trust God? Trust God. Respond to your parents' loving discipline. God is good. It's a serious matter, the matter of discipline, and we should be sober about it but not fearful. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a promise. That's a promise of Scripture. God makes promises, and he keeps the promises he makes. In Acts 2, 39, so the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. These promises they belong to our children. They must only take them, take hold of them by faith. Psalm 103, 17 through 18 gives us this beautiful promise. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children and to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Listen to Mary's song in Luke 1. This is buried right in there. If for some reason the Old Testament doesn't count for you. Listen to Mary. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Right? The context is in her child. It's from generation to generation. It's amazing the promises in Scripture. I live by promises. How else can you get through life without promises? We all have people that we give tasks to. And then afterwards, we wonder, did that get done? Did they do it? I hope they actually did it. But then, 
We have people in our life that, uh, like I think of employees, uh, they're of such character, when you give them something to do, you just assumed it's as good as done, and you don't need to check it. It's always done. Now, God has repeatedly said he will do something, and that should be a great comfort to us because God makes and keeps promises. He's not like us. Ryle, again, he says, think what it is to have a promise like this, referring to Proverbs 22. Promises were the only lamp of hope which cheered the hearts of the patriarchs before the Bible was written. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all lived on a few promises and prospered in their souls. Promises are the cordials which in every age have supported and strengthened the believer. He that has got a plain text upon his side never need be cast down. Fathers and mothers, when your hearts are failing, ready to halt, look at the word of this text and take comfort. Take comfort in the promises of God. Memorize them. Let them be written on your heart. Sing them. Rehearse them. When your wife is struggling, speak them to her. When your husband is struggling, speak them to him. Let the word of God be the thing that strengthens you and carries you through this life and the hard, hard, or hard task of parenting. Ryle continues, or excuse me, <clears throat> he continues, think who it is that promises. It is not the word of man who may lie or change his mind. It is the word of the king of kings who never changes. Has he said a thing and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Neither is anything too hard for him to perform. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. When it comes to discipline, we discipline in faith, in faith in God, and it changes how we discipline. We don't parent weighed down in fear and anxiety. It's a weird energy when it all depends on you. I had a friend who thought salvation all depended on him, and he, he got in a weird place where if he didn't preach the gospel to someone, he thought it might be his fault that they went to hell. And he got like kind of neurotic about it. Like we couldn't get out of a grocery store to get somewhere without him like trying to talk to everyone. So at first it was kind of cool and it was neat and God did work through it. But after a while I was like, man, you just, we just preach the word and you know, God gives the growth, right? The Lord, the Lord will work through it and we're not in control of everything. We have to trust God's providence. You've, You've gone a, a weird way. And that's one of the great blessings of God's sovereignty. Wrongly understood, you may say, well, it doesn't matter what I do, right? On one hand, that's God's going to save who's going to save. But rightly understood, you're able to rest that God works things out. He's got a plan for everything. It doesn't all depend on us, right? It's not all about us. So we don't parent out of a desperate sort of anger. God is working on our behalf in the soul of our child. We can't save them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But trust in the Lord in your parenting and in your corrective discipline. It will transform the atmosphere of your home. You're disciplining them because God commands you to and you know he's going to work through it. So it's not, there's not this, um, it's all in me. You're praying, God, work through this. God, change their heart. God, be with me. It's the atmosphere of the home should be a sweet atmosphere where you have this confidence in the Lord. That's what promises do. They change the way you come at things. You stop worrying so much. You stop uh, overreacting. Now, uh, a few practical thoughts on spanking. Never spank if you feel you aren't in total self-control. Sometimes people say never spank if you're angry. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. That's kind of hard. But you must be in control. If you lack it, it's just better to forego spanking. Uh, our God's uh, discipline is always measured, just, and appropriate to the situation. And that's what we're trying to reflect to our children in our discipline. We're trying to teach them about God. Now, never spank for an accident. Kids are clumsy, right? They are so clumsy. They run into walls somehow. Like, it's there. It's really big. I don't know how you didn't see it. They just run right into them. Sometimes they spill milk. If you're like me, you see the milk cup and you just know that for some reason they're going to like throw that elbow over and <laughs> it goes everywhere. Um, now, uh, there's a difference between being clumsy and being reckless. If you have discipline, if you have warned a kid about being reckless and you're calling him to 
to think ahead and be careful. Um, you've repeatedly warned them there may be a, a, a time for spanking there, you know, but you have to discern. You have to treat those things differently. Uh, there's a difference between true, honest accidents and, and willful disobedience. Never spank in such a way to cause an injury. Uh, I recommend some type of swat on the buttocks, right? There's a lot of fat there, and my goal is always to cause a sharp but temporary pain. I think of it as skipping a rock across a lake. It's like, snap, it hurts, there's no bruises. I'm not trying to like cause anything but to get your attention in this moment. So I think spanking should sting, but the goal is not to bruise kids and get into their muscle. And that's like, if you're like losing it, man, that's a problem. You got to back off. Now, the flip side is don't spank symbolically. I see this a lot of times. Just like little, little puff on, and then they got diapers. And if you're doing cloth diapers, the kid might as well be wrapped in five pillows, right? And if you've done cloth diapers, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I remember we couldn't really spank at Center and Athens because they grew up with cloth diapers. It was hard, you know, and, and then pulling that diaper down is risky sometimes. So you, you might spank. Um, but, um, but don't spank symbolically. It's just better, again, not to. In other words, it should sting. It should cause a temporary pain because you're trying to create association between the pain that comes from sin that will come down the line. You want that to be there, and it's not a symbolic thing. And I would also say spank them often when they're young for clear sins. Yeah, spanking should become a rarity, I think, by the time your child's six. Uh, the pain of discipline when it comes to spanking should be front-loaded. Everyone talks about how terrible teenagers are. Teenagers are hormonal. It's a little different than terrible, right? If you go without sleep, you are kind of hormonal too. I think good parents produce good teenagers. I've seen very sweet teenagers that fear the Lord, that love the Lord. And when things are flaring up in their bodies, they're a little all over the place. But that's different than a child that's never been disciplined and is living in this sort of reckless way. You know, oh, you just wait. You just wait till they become teenagers. I can't wait. I'm happy. I'm happy that they can take care of themselves. And then I don't have to discipline for little silly things anymore. Because God works with discipline. So you just wait to their teenagers. If you're disciplining them now, you'll see a lovely fruit in that time in their life. It's something to look forward to. It's not something to dread. Why is everyone trying to make everyone dread children? It's crazy. It's wonderful. This is a wonderful thing we've been given, and God will work through your imperfect parenting. Look forward to it. It's a great thing. And when you spank, explain why you're spanking them. Uh, generally, both before and afterwards, generally. You are correcting them. You want them to understand. Corrective discipline must be paired with appropriate instruction. Now, I've seen some parents, when you got like a three-year-old that, that does something crazy, like going into a deep theological discourse, I don't think that's the best use of your time. Early on, the kid needs to know that God has made you their authority and you love and care for them, and they discipline you. And that's usually enough when they're really tiny. But the older they get, the more they can understand, the more you want them to understand. And kids are way smarter than people give them credit for. They learn things way quicker. And so you, your goal is to actually train them, train them up in the way. Your goal in spanking is not to break their will. You'll hear people say that. These aren't horses, right? They're not dogs. They're people. And if you understand horses, you understand that you don't even break their wills. That's not how it works. I have seen many children grow up in uh, churches that talk a whole lot about spanking. And they're these depressive, downer kids. I think they were overspanked. I want my kids to have strong wills. This life requires uh, a strength of will, but it must be trained. It must be focused on the Lord. You're training them. They need to learn that you are their authority. You are. God has put you over them, and you care for them. And someday, you won't be there. Son, there'll be a day where you're the only one that can say no to yourself. I won't be there anymore. You'll have to want it. You'll wish that I was there to be a speed bump for you, a guardrail. 
So listen to me, I love you. I'm doing this because I care about you. Always, after you spank them, pray with them if you can. Now look, rules are generalities, right? Like I remember once, one of my kids shall remain nameless. I'm not saying you should do this. I don't know why he did it, but we were at a park and he picks up just a big thing of mulch and slams it in this little girl's face. And as a dad, you're just mortified. And you're like, what in the world? And so, like, I uh, took him around a tree and, like, you know, smacked. I can't have my kids slamming stuff in other kids' face. It's just a rule. It's a house rule with the Fosters. I recommend it to everyone, but, uh, you know, don't want to be too judgmental here. Uh, nonetheless... Sometimes you're not able to spank right away. It's just not wise. You're in a, and you're like, and you know, you go to the grocery store sometimes, women, and they like decide to push every button. Praise the Lord for Walmart pickup, right? And uh, anyhow, um, but sometimes you're not able to like sit down and pray with them and go through the whole rigmarole. But you want to really go out of the way to pray with your kids afterwards and reaffirm to them your love to them. Right? You want them to know that you love them. And that's what this is about. And that's why when you're spanking, it is very controlled. It's very consistent. It's a practice. It's actually a discipline for you. Lastly, you've got to be consistent. If you don't enforce the rules, they won't follow them. This is especially true for young children. If you tell them to do something, you must follow up and ensure that they have done it. They must learn follow through and accountability from you. The more you follow up, the more consistent you are, the less you'll have to do this. Uh, They must learn the consequences of not respecting their authorities and not doing their job and not obeying God. If you don't do your job as a parent, neither will they do it as a child. And we have a whole sermon coming just for you kids. John Weiss is going to bring the fire, right? So don't worry. They'll get it to you, parents. Um, But lazy parents make lazy children. This is hard work. It is hard work. Now note that Solomon says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You don't always see the results of discipline immediately. You know, you'll hear this from parents. We've been consistent the last month. Well, you're going to have to string a few more of those months together, okay? Um, It's going to take a while. Um, It takes a long time. And there are some kids that are definitely a little more stubborn than the others. Uh, And sometimes it, it will take nearly a lifetime. I have had the privilege of being with old men who grew up in the church and rebelled in their late teens, early 20s, and in their 80s, in their 80s, repent and come to faith because something their grandma said to them 70 years ago, 70 years ago, she totally forgot. Everyone's forgot. He didn't forget. It was in there. It was a pebble in his shoe. It's a little burr. It's been sticking him for years and years. And then one day, God in his magnificent grace says, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. And he's brought to repentance and he dies. You know who he's joined with in heaven most likely? His faithful grandma. When he's old, he won't depart from it. These are conditional promises. They don't always work out this way. They're real promises, things you can take comfort in for those of you who have done all you could and sincerely tried to raise your kids up in fearing the Lord. And some of them have, um, have gone astray. You have some prodigals in your life. Take comfort in this promise. Keep praying. Don't lose heart. God is so powerful. God doesn't waste your efforts. God works through broken people like us to accomplish great things. God works through our discipline and discipleship to call our children to himself. In a healthy church, you should see faith pass from generation to generation. That's normal. An intergenerational church where grandkids love the same God that their grandfather loved. That's normal. So in the next two weeks, we're going to look more at the positive form of discipline. Right? So we have two types of discipline. Corrective, so that's what we think of when we think of, uh, you know, punishments. But they're not punishments in a judicial sense. They're corrective and trying to show them the right way to go. And then we have formative, 
That's like, here's who the Lord is. Here's what the Lord desires of you. Here's how you do this and that. It's about educating your kids and raising them up in the instruction of the Lord. So we'll look at fathers next week and mothers the week after. And I hope that will encourage you. But lean on the promises. Lean on the promises. Trust God. Let that be the rest from which you parent. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word we thank you for the sharpness of it, that it, it cuts right to it. But Lord, your, um, your word's not a hacksaw, it's a scalpel. And you're a God that does heart surgery on your people and seek to give us thick skin and soft hearts that love you, God. Help us to be consistent in our parenting. Forgive us for we have been wrathful and angry. Forgive us for we have been uh, weighed down with worry and we haven't trusted you, God. Forgive us for not meditating on your promises and singing your promises and speaking your promises uh, within our household and to each other, we do pray there would be a great confidence for us, God. We ask that you would give us the, the strength and discipline to rightly uh, correct our children. Uh, Lord, we thank you that it's not through the perfect method of parenting that you work, God, but through just the, the faithful day in and day out of normal believers that you are Please to work through these means to call children to yourself. And we do ask that you would give our children faith, a robust, real faith, not a nominal Christianity, not some wishy-washy, lukewarm nonsense, but a faith that's ready to stand for you forever and ever and knows that the world makes promises that it doesn't keep, but you are a God that has never broken his word. And we pray this would be our strength in your son's name. Amen.